Hello, thank you all for joining. This is going to be a really spicy talk. I'm really looking forward to getting into the details of all of this. But I think first what we should do is just to talk about who pays for the metaverse. We need to think about what it's actually like in this emerging space. We need to speak to some contributors who are expertly creating the space and entering the space. So as we have said, we have Dami Hastrup, who is the CEO and founder of Moon Hub. Now, this is a startup that's kind of rocketing at the moment, and it's going to be really exciting to hear from him and get a sense of what he's thinking about the metaverse. And then we've also got Oyen Adebayo, who is the founder of NEO, which is a group that helps support black women into the space that is now going to be coined the metaverse, but she's also been supporting black women in the NEO kind of concept as well for quite a while now. So if you'd like to introduce yourselves, do you want to go first, Dami? Sorry, I thought uh, well, uh, I thought that that was like an intro thing, so I set the mic. My apologies. Um, but yeah, my name is Dami. I'm the founder and CEO of MoonHub. We are the virtual reality training platform that's allowing companies to get far more return on investment for their learning and development spend. So we work with companies from Just Eat to BNP Paribas to Savills uh, and a bunch of others. Um, we're growing pretty quickly. We're onboarding new clients uh, every sort of week, uh, Zurich being one of the most recent ones. Um, and yeah, we're yeah, very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And then Oyen. Hi, everyone. Good. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming along to listen to this talk. We hope to add so much value to you. So my name is Oyen Adebayo. I'm the founder and CEO of Neo Group. Um, we're a group of companies that focuses on enabling and empowering black women economically through getting them to be producers of high impact ecosystems. Now, what makes me an expert in this field? We actually build an app that connects content creators to brands and users through fractional NFTs and turning those fractional NFTs into real products. So, um, yeah, so that's essentially what we what that specific brand does. But we also have a metaverse solution that actually looks to onboard um, 2,000 black women um, by the end of 2024 um, to interact with all of the different aspects of what Neo does. Thank you both, and we really appreciate you both taking time to come and speak to us here today. I think what we should start with is just giving people some context as to what the metaverse actually is. It's one of those foundational questions that you ask in one of these conversations. So who would like to attempt and give people an idea, at least in the context of this discussion, what the metaverse means? Okay, perfect. Um, so um, I was actually speaking to, to you, Lorna, earlier on before we started. Um, now, the metaverse in itself, in my opinion, is a virtual space, a virtual world, um, where we can actually connect with people anywhere across the world. So you would have heard about like people building offices on the metaverse, build, people having property on the metaverse. But actually, what makes it even more special now is that actually starting to add value to you. Um, so instead of you just being on this virtual world, but actually you actually you know th do things like play to earn you do things like um, interact to earn with the space um, and so that's what makes it um, makes the web 3 part of it really 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 important um, so just for those people that don't know what web 3 is um, we're currently in web 2 you can argue um, it's currently a read and write and interact um, internet era. Now Web3 is actually an era that actually decentralizes what we have in Web2, where you actually add, it adds value to you and you can actually earn by interacting with the different spaces and the different parts. So um, yeah, that's essentially my, my perspective on the metaverse. Good one. Go ahead, Dami. Yeah, no, that was brilliant. Uh, I'll build on what Oyin says and you know basically say that it's a new uh, added dimension to social interaction, uh, not only within sort of social media, like what Meta is trying to do with their uh, metaverse ventures, but then also a different way of interacting with space that we see around us, right? So um, there is often, I wouldn't say misconception, but an idea of the metaverse, whereas I like to think of it as several metaverses that may one day uh, accumulate into one metaverse. They're essentially allowing for a new plane of interaction, uh, be that through corporate training or be it through social interaction or games or different things, having sort of either virtual avatars or representations of yourself in these spaces that can then almost act on your behalf through what you're doing in your actions. Um, it's basically a new dimension of trying to interact with you know, a metaphysical world, essentially. Cool, cool, very cool. So 
Let's get into it a bit. I had done a bit of research and I saw that this past month, September, 39 million had been invested in metaverse based startups. And there has been year to date a continual increase in the investment around this sector, covering the umbrella of Web3 as well. Are we talking about something that's a gimmick or a fad? What, what are we saying? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So uh, I, in terms of the year to date figure, we contributed to that. So we closed a $2.6 million round earlier this year. Uh, <laughs> Can we take a moment to clap that? That's incredible. Thank you so much. So we have uh, Pi Labs as our lead investors, Ada Ventures joined in and, and 1818 and others as well. Um, but what we're seeing is it, it's not a fad. Uh, you know, years ago, when I founded Moonhub back in 2016, uh, before VR was cool, it's arguably not cool now to a lot of people, but even still, um, you know, we we knew that this was definitely going to be the next way of capturing data that otherwise couldn't be captured, especially when it comes to mimicking what a real life environment can be. Um, and we're seeing, especially when it comes to companies, they're not seeing VR as a cool new workshop team building thing anymore. They're seeing it as a real tool to actually benefit them and add value, uh, whether that's reducing their you know, costs at the bottom line, whether that's uh, increasing productivity, we're seeing it across the board. Um, and you know, companies like Google who have backed us as well and you know, really showing that they believe and other companies as well believing that you know, VR isn't just a fad, it's here to stay. And one of the big four, Meta, obviously doubling down and really going for immersive tech, um, just shows you that there is definitely a future in where this is going. Um, yeah, I definitely would say it's not a fad. Um, if you actually look at how the, in, well, I'm very web, I'm a Web3 fan. Like, I believe in the ethos and the philosophy of Web3. But, um, so therefore, I'm going to be speaking more from a decentralized perspective. Um, and what I mean by that is actually power being distributed to all of the players involved. Um, so from a Web3 perspective, it's not a fad because as we've seen the internet evolve, how many people here remember when we used to interact on MSN? <laughs> how many people here remember when we used to write emails to people um, as our main point of communication? How many people remember when we used to go to the phone booth to like, you know, so you look at how, how like um, technology has um, evolved over the years and you realize that this is just a natural growth for how we're moving. Um, the problems that we have right now is centralization. We also have problems where we actually want more from our interactions with other people socially. Um, so obviously the announcements of Facebook turning into Meta has contributed to that to see, okay, you can speak to a, you know, you can get your avatar to go to the office on the metaverse. Um, and it's just a natural, um, moving forward in terms of the advancements of technology. But what I really, really am passionate about within the metaverse is how can we move from just, um, you know, just being present in virtual spaces, but actually how do we actually make sure that that is adding value to people, which is where Web3 comes into it. Um, so if I purchase an NFT on the metaverse, I've purchased some shoes, on the metaverse and I've minted it as an NFT and I wore those shoes to a corporate event on the metaverse um, and actually that earns me more points because my shoes are so cool. Um, that's what I'm really, really passionate about and actually, you know, you actually doing that actually contributes so much more to the ecosystem and you're also being, our value is also being added to you too. That's really great. Thank you both. I think we've got several things that are interconnected here with the challenges that are faced with talking about the metaverse capital t capital m um, is thinking about all of the component parts that it takes to bring the metaverse together we have education we have infrastructure and there's so much more around hardware and software can you speak to some of the challenges that you've seen and you faced within both of your respective businesses on moving into, shifting into the space or actually propelling your business like yourself, Demi, in this space? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I think the challenges have evolved over time. So, uh, I mean, one constant theme has been education around what, you know, immersive tech actually can do. Uh, so when we first started, people we would always think, why VR? We were very convinced, even with small studies that we were like, you know, conducting as we were going along. Then PwC come out with their very you know, famous report in 2020 about, you know, we, we all know the stats, four times quicker training, up to 64% reduced costs at scale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for 
us, I think now, especially with the word metaverse, a lot of people are confused. And I think that in part, and it may be controversial with me saying this, but I think it was given a name a bit prematurely, right? I think before social media was social media as we know it, we had Facebook, right? Back in the uh, archaic days of just sending a poke to somebody or MySpace or Bebo, if you want to go that far back, we were still figuring out what it was. Um, and no one was trying to like push it super forward that quickly. Whereas now I think that there is something as monumental in terms of a shift happening right now, but people are just trying to get it figured out super, super quickly. And I think that no, there's a lot to still discover and explore whilst also making genuine use of it. So the same way that social media naturally evolved to what it is now, I think allowing people to not necessarily know fully what their specific use cases for the metaverse would be would help, especially when it comes to understanding what it is going forward. Mm, mm, that's true. Oyen, anything to add? Um, no, actually, I think he's really covered so much, so much great stuff already. Um, so, yeah. I think that's really a great point. It's not, I don't think that's controversial at all. I think we need to really respect the amount of infrastructure needs, the amount of talent and skill set that is needed in order to explore this territory and allow ourselves the space and the time to experiment in this in this world. And actually the metaverse has existed way before probably most of some of the people here's lifetime with Second Life and has come from sci-fi comic authors such as Snow Crash. The metaverse as a term has existed for a while now. So absolutely, I think it's important to get to think about intentionally where we're moving and be conscientious as well in this space because you know how things can go down. <laughs> um, but let's shift the conversation a bit more to the idea and the concept around how we see it moving forward and anyone that may be inspiring us in the space. Have you got any people that you are keeping an eye on, any companies that you are watching or things that are happening that are influencing thoughts around decisions as you move forward? Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I think what I'm re one of the companies I'm really excited about is actually a good friend of mine's company called Astroverse. They have actually a stand downstairs, so please go and check them out. Um, so they, they're building gamification for fashion um, through the metaverse and have this kind of like play to earn um, ethos around what they're doing. So yeah, definitely excited about what they're doing. I think for, for me specifically, um, what I want to actually see moving forward within the space is can we build things that have less processing power um, and actually build more simple solutions because the, what, we're, what we're doing right now requires, I was speaking to you about it earlier on, it requires a lot of processing power, it requires a lot of technical things. Now, I remember I was speaking to a, um, someone in fashion and actually thinking about how the metaverse or blockchain or you know the different like new technologies that are emerging right now to actually for us see it as just technology um, how can smart supply chains and the metaverse solutions and um, crypto how can they be all streamlined within the, the same um, piece of technology and at NeoDAP that's essentially what we're trying to achieve we want to be able to see a world where someone sees your content on, on NeoDAP they try it on, they actually see the supply chain journey through smart supply chain um, technology. Um, they mint a, like a fractional NFT and they get the real product or service um, connected to that. That is what we're trying to put. It's going to take time. It, it is a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of investment and a lot of the right resources. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I think in terms of me personally, people that I look at, um, so some friends of mine, so Ryan uh, Ryan Howell and the team at MX are looking at photogrammetry and really bringing real life objects into uh, metaverse sort of environments. Um, you know, I know uh, Imperia, they're doing great stuff in, around retail and VR, but I think seeing stories, there was one a few months ago about um, these twins, Siamese twins, that were able to be separated because the surgeons were able to practice the surgery multiple times in VR. It's really inspiring because I mean Moon Hub is a corporate training company and we know that we want to impact lives going forward but seeing VR already being used to change lives forever in even more drastic ways is always going to be inspiring and um, what, where I want to see Moon Hub go is I want a fair way of training and you know assessing people's abilities I think you know especially in the corporate world a lot of the time 
you know, training and, you know, these things are often at times missed opportunities for companies to actually see the talent in people. Um, and even less so in sort of retail jobs or jobs where, let's say, and I use the word low skill very loosely because I think every uh, job needs a skill to an extent, um, but where comprehensive skills may not be equally uh, fitted and people's reading comprehension skills on tests and you know quizzes even to get a job at Sainsbury's may not be great. Whereas if they're tasked with spotting customers that may need assistance, spotting um, potential shoplifters, etc., and they're doing it brilliantly, but they're able to rely on what they're good at, not necessarily just having to read from a script, uh, it can really level the playing field and we want to create that level playing field and just use virtual reality to essentially make it far more inclusive as well um, going forward. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks both. Some really, yeah, really great and important points raised there. And since we have you and something that's a little bit of a shift in a conversation, just first steps. You're both running businesses. You have been in spaces that are helping you, for example, you, Oyen, pivot into the metaverse and for yourself being part of the component part, Dami, of the metaverse infrastructure or framework. Can you give any advice to anyone around steps into the metaverse? Maybe not even at the business level, in a skill set level. Any advice? Um, interesting you asked that. We actually run, well, near a group, we have a boot camp part of the business where we upskill black women specifically um, to get into tech and one of the programs that we run is an XR bootcamp where we actually upskill black women to become VR and AR developers. Um, in 2021 we ran a cohort of, 50, no, of 20 black women um, that actually built solutions that launched on the metaverse. They actually developed it and they are now Unity developers, a certified Unity developers. Um, so yeah, coming on programs like ours to upskill, we had so many interesting projects. Actually, one of the ladies built, she was a PhD student at Aston University who was looking at neuro, neuroscience and how the brain, how the brain affected um, people's, like, um, how the brain affected people's cognitive behavior. And she used VR to actually bring some solution in, in, in health tech. Um, we had people who built like games, um, like um, games that actually brought solutions um, to um, helping people who had autis autism. Um, so many different like really cool projects like that. Um, and so that's kind of like one of the things that we do to help you be able to actually learn the skills needed. And I have to give a massive shout out to Taryn 3D. I know that Taryn is part of the Color in Tech. Um, so Taryn is actually um, our lead trainer for that specific boot camp and it was so, super, super cool to see the amount of women that came out of it um, and now are now like VR and AR developers. Um, so yeah, that's a, a natural first step. Not many companies actually do those types of trainings and actually I'm proud to say that we're one of the very few that do that. Yeah, uh, I mean, my advice would be, first stop should be going to, you know, Oyen over here. Um, and the second thing is, I mean, yeah, I can also agree, Taryn's fantastic. Um, I think when it comes to starting, uh, I think it kind of applies to anything. You have to just try anything and everything that you can within your current skill set whilst also trying to improve. So uh, C Sharp, uh, proficiency in Unity, these things are obviously very important. Um, but, you know, going into something it's not always important to have a vision, especially if you just want to enjoy it. But if you do want to create something that's impactful, think about how you would want to use it in your everyday life, something that was missing that you would want it. Um, and then you'll start to be able to build something around it. I mean, that's exactly what we did with Moonhub. Um, look, let's be very honest, corporate training sucks. If I said, yeah, this is a corporate training webinar, every seat would be empty. Uh, let's just be honest here. So we wanted to change that and we wanted to allow for people to get a more engaging experience that we wish we had. Um, and you know that was just a very easy, open and shut case um, because we knew if we wanted it, we're not the only ones in the world. And if you're wanting to start something before learning the skill sets, before learning everything else, understand what your passion is in that because starting a company and running a company can become very tedious. Uh, there will be highs, there'll be a lot of lows, but what will always drive you forward in that is your passion for what you're doing and the ultimate belief that everything will pay off in the end. Um, not even monetarily, just being able to achieve what your mission and your goal was. Um, so yeah, I think I went a little bit abstract on that one, but 
No, that was lovely. And go, yeah. go I was on. just going to oh, add one more thing. Head. So a lot of what we're talking about now sounds really good in theory, I'm sure, to a lot of people. But in your head, you're like, this still, this concept is probably still quite complex. So um, at Neo, we actually open up opportunities. We actually give out scholarships to go to a lot of Web3 conferences, Metaverse conferences. So last year, we went to the Metaverse Summit. We took two women. I took two women with me. So it's really important to be in the environment where people are already building stuff. So you can actually learn and take things on like sponges. Um, so yes, if you're a black woman, we really have so many opportunities. So next week, um, there's going to be two of our ladies going to the Polygon um, Polygon Summit in Portugal. We're going to be taking three of our ladies to Web Summit. So being in those environments is super, super duper important for you to really, truly learn quickly. A lot of the concepts I'm speaking about today, trust me, I didn't Google them. I actually learned them by going to these places. So yeah. I need to take a leaf out, uh, a leaf out of your book. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you super powerful just such powerful points there and I think what we can do now if we've got this power and you both being in the spaces that you're in and the platforms that you have is what's the call to action to say initiatives funders investors if there's anyone here those watching what would your call to action be to them because you are contributing a lot to this environment and to this sector what could they do to help you guys? Uh, it's interesting. I think what I would say, because it's quite a general assess, sort of assess, address um, to people, and you know, investors will want to know, okay, well, if they're going to be my 10, 20, 30x return, customers will want to know, okay, will this actually change my life for the better and make it easier? People who want to get into the metaverse will want to know, is it going to be gate kept? Is it quite easy to enter? And to everyone, I'll say it's not as wacky and wild as people think. Okay, it is, but it's not as bad <laughs> as people may think. And the thing is, is that, you know, I, think, I, I believe that when it comes to just getting more involved in it, don't look at the buzzword of Metaverse. Go for real life applications, see what people are using VR headsets for, see how people are interacting in these mediums like, uh, you know, I think even games like Roblox and all those are counted under the Metaverse. My brother plays it all the time. Um, and the thing is, is that, you know, when you start to understand what it is, you may see how you fit in there, whether you're an investor, whether you're a customer, uh, whether you're somebody who just wants to get in there. Um, that's my call to action. Just figure out a little bit more about what the Metaverse can do for you. Um, a call to action, I guess, to um, ecosystem players, first of all, is, as I said to you, I go to a lot of conferences and I don't see many people that look like me, so I've taken a responsibility on myself to take people to, with me. It's actually partnering up with organizations like ourselves to really galvanize um, what we're doing. So um, in our bootcamp business, we focus a lot on the Web2 side of things um, and you know, we've taught some metaverse solutions um, as well but actually now we're looking into like the Web3 side of things. So it all starts with education because for you to really like galvanize a community or galvanize a people, you've really, really got to start with educating them. So we're going to be starting an NFT short course with Unstoppable Domains soon. Um, you know, that's one step. Um, and we're looking to replicate that with many other companies. So if you're a Web2 company that doesn't, that doesn't know much, we're happy to like support you in educating you, but also um, for you to actually get involved too. So that's my advice. Thank you. Thanks both very much. Do we have time for questions? If anyone has any audience questions that we could pass the mic around. I can see some hands. Is there anyone that's looking to ask a question? Go on. Who's got the mic? Who's out here with the mic? Yeah, should we go to here? Hi, thank you both for your um, great presentations and the contributions you're making. Um, I have a question that like centers on the tech stacks that you're both using and also some of the risks. Um, I know there are lots of rewards, you discussed that brilliantly, but some of the risks of the metaverse are starting with the tech stack. I'd love to know, Oyen, what chain are you building on? and how you're sort of navigating maybe the challenges of working with companies who are holding on to their IP and maybe are not so open to decentralizing. And for Dami, I'd love to understand more sort of like how do you build a VR company from the software side of things and how are you sort of navigating the challenges of picking up data about people's environments and the risks of that? Thank you. Thank you, Dami. Um, so we're building on Near Protocol. So I don't know how many people know Near here. Um, so that's what we're building. But what we found very difficult, if I'm being honest, because a lot of our uh, the stuff on our DAP is very, very um, metadata heavy. 
And so we have to still rely on, we have to still be relying on web um, Google Cloud. I'm glad I saw I'm so glad to see Google's announcements a few days ago on really like thinking about things from a you know um, a crypto perspective, although we're not talking about crypto today. Um, but yeah, like merging IPFS um, solution with Google Cloud um, is really, really important. So um, yeah, our, our front end is Rust um, and our, you know, that's essentially what we're using because we're building on Near. Um, and, our, and our back end is still very much a traditional um, back, end, back end software. It is difficult, I have to let you know that one now. Um, it's not completely Web3. I would say it's Web 2.5. In fact, our interface is Web 2.5 because not many people have been deployed into this space to be able to connect their wallet. Um, so we have like a small, simple solution of um, put your emailing and log in to get code um, rather than we want your full data. Now, when it comes to risks, um, there's still a lot of security issues that we have to like um, think about. So think um, we're, we're starting to think about using like things like zero knowledge proof um, ideology. So for, for those that don't know, the idea of zero knowledge proof um, is um, the fact that you could tell someone that you have something. Let's say you could tell someone that you have £100,000 in your bank account, but you don't have to show them for them to really know that. So it's trustless. Um, so we are looking at using some those mathematical concepts like zero knowledge proof to really look at safety um, and privacy. Um, but my team we're all still learning and it's very, very difficult because how can you build a trustless, trustless space but also um, make it safe? It's really interesting. But yeah, I'm happy to talk about it in more depth with you. I could geek out on it for ages. Good yeah. question though, deep question. Do you want to answer? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, yeah, I won't spend too long on the, sort of the tech stack side because I really like the risk side of the question, although I could go on for ages. But I mean, front end um, Unity, uh, React, and you know, back end you know, SQL and um, migrating from Azure to AWS and, I can go on for ages about why we're reshuffling things, but more on the risk side, I really like that question. When it comes to capturing data, people's data is very important, right? You want to trust that, okay, if I'm terrible at noticing, let's say this microaggression within a diversity, equity, inclusion training segment, who is seeing that? <laughs> what are they gonna do with that information? We make sure that people's data is, is, is safe. Um, we don't allow for uh, third parties to view it. We don't allow for people to buy our data um, because, you know, at the aha of what we do, we want people to trust us. Uh, and in turn, um, you know, we can then provide them with a fantastic experience um, and really help them grow along their journey. Not everyone's going to start in a brilliant space. I know, you know, nowadays the data play is a huge thing and, you know, people sell data like left, right and center. Um, and in the future, if our data can be used to help them and give it back to them to better them uh, in, in their topics, that was what we'll do. Um, but you know, we make sure that names aren't stored as names on our databases. We make sure that email addresses are also in a similar fashion. Um, everything's sort of coded and matched on our side. Um, and we've taken many steps to make sure that you know, your privacy is secure um, if you want certain scores omitted. Uh, and just given like a general score, we have been requested uh, to do that as well. So we really make sure that people's data uh, and everything is protected. Thank you both. That was a great question. We've got 10 minutes. Yeah, okay, so we had a question there. Hi, thank you so much, for both of you, for sharing your knowledge and back here, back here. <laughs> thank you. Um, Oye, I actually um, met someone at your booth downstairs, okay. um, part of the NEO education program, and she stated that there is a preference for those in the West Midlands. I'm based here in London, so I'm just wondering what it's likely for someone like myself applying for your program in order to get accepted? So um, this is a continuing issue that we have in our in, in near boot camp. So just to be transparent, the way our, our boot camps work is very much, you know, led by um, corporates and um, and government. Um, a lot of our government um, stuff is very much focused in the West Midlands at the moment. There's a big push. But this is why I'm calling out to corporates who really want to partner with us so that people like yourself can come on up boot camps and it's not restricted by, by location. So um, we actually had a Goldman Sachs boot camp that we um, led um, that was nationwide. So I'm happy to speak to you. All of our boot camps are nationwide at the moment. We've negotiated that. But if you do get an opportunity, it's got to be focused in the West Midlands, unfortunately. But I'm happy to speak to you about it in private. Um, but calling out to corporates who really want to see more black women in their, in their places, um, that's not just restricted within the West Midlands. We have like a global audience, but we can only serve a small, small, small section of them. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks for the question and corporates, those who are representing here and watching, listen, listen up, help us out. And um, we've got a question here. Hello. Um, sorry, I had my hand up, but I'm, I'm not a corporate. Um, <laughs> my name is Howard. I'm the founder of Rent Equipment Now. Um, my query about the metaverse, I suppose, is we still need interfaces to actually engage with the metaverse, right? And I'm talking about the hardware, because I guess a lot of the conversation is around kind of the software and, you know, building things when, once you're actually there. So I suppose I wanted to ask you guys, who are the players that are doing something to make sure that everyone can actually access the metaverse in terms of making sure that they have the hardware available to actually even start? That's a really good question. Um, I'll quickly jump on it and I'll let you go. I mean, I think first and foremost, uh, I know I just want to say, Oi, what you're doing is fantastic. Uh, I just want everyone to acknowledge that this is some fantastic work you're doing. And when it comes to the hardware, in terms of key players, we're seeing the hardware costs of things like VR headsets come down more and more year on year. Um, so Moonhub, we use Pico. Uh, Pico are the leading B2B hardware um, providers uh, in the market because of their one, uh, hardware, so their AP, um, uh, the APIs and their SDKs make it very easy for us to work with them, boot things up in kiosk mode. But on the consumer side, you still see big players like Meta, um, HTC, uh, other VR hardware providers still keeping sort of higher price points. What's important is you know, for these bigger companies to start having schemes where you can get headsets, you can get hardware for a lower cost. I spoke to a rep from Meta who actually said that there is a scheme that they have where they actually donate a lot of uh, they're called MetaQuests now, aren't they? A lot of MetaQuest headsets um, to companies who plan and intend on distributing them to people from underrepresented backgrounds, people who may not necessarily gain access to these bits of kit ordinarily. I think those kind of schemes are fantastic because until you know actual R&D is at a point of you know critical. Um, I won't say critical mass, but uh, when it's at a point where it can actually bring costs down across the board reliably, that's when we'll see that shift. But I think in the meantime, having big corporate companies do their bit to make the tech more accessible uh, is super important, from my opinion. Lovely. Sounds really good. Um, I actually didn't know about the meta distribution um, thing. I, I thought it was just very much focused on people that were on their developer I, I think um, it's public knowledge. Oh, no. so oh okay. okay. I mean, I'll love to speak to you about that afterwards. Um, um, yeah, I think it is. No, actually, in my, at Neo, when we did the XR boot camp, we invested crazy amounts um, to give out headsets for free to everyone that took part um, on that boot camp um, specifically. Um, but there was actually an AR, there was a, a pair of, well, there were some AR glasses that launched a few weeks back. I can't remember the name. We actually put it in our newsletter. Um, and they actually retail for about £100, um, where you actually can... Um, essentially interact with your phone and your laptop all at the same time with the AR glasses. Um, so there is stuff already happening in the space. It is going to take time. Um, and for us to, I think again, we were speaking about it, having contact lenses in your eyes that has the same type of battery as your, as your phone poses a lot of, of risk. Um, <laughs> so it's going to take time for us to really get there to have that massive adoption. But a lot of, actually, a lot of platforms that are in the metaverse are not just VR enabled. They are, you can also interact with stuff um, just normally through your laptop. So again, my friends downstairs, Dells, who's building Astroverse, you can interact with his game literally from your laptop. So that's a, a, good, a, a, you know, a good starting point before we can actually be able to scale this further. In order for us to scale it, we need education first. Um, and for us, to, for us to scale it and for us to then be able to make the interaction with it simpler. We've got to start from education. That's what I'm really, really passionate about. Yeah. Thank you very much both. Those were some really important points raised there. So yes, check that out. Look at the web VR options and yeah, keep an eye on things. Things generally tend to progress downwards as access becomes more open and also all of these component parts, the hardware, the solutions in order for us to deliver these products become more accessible to the suppliers. So just watch this space. Any more questions? One more question. The last question, who gets it? Okay. Hiya. Um, you mentioned
mentioned MXR Dami earlier, and I was actually one of their first interns. <laughs> I was designing a platform for them, and now I'm a product designer at Twitter. Um, Oyun, you're more than welcome <laughs> to come and speak to us. I've brought a bunch of people here from the company. Um, but my question is, so I'm currently working on products to help creators and SMBs to grow on the platform. How do people who are on the metaverse advertise um, their product? And like, what, what kind of advice do you have for people who do have um, products in this place? Um, and how do you, what's your kind of strategy? I'm kind of curious to know. I mean, I can go first because mine's a quick answer uh, as we sort of straddle between metaverse and traditional SaaS. Um, also, a small world around, about Ryan, Elliot, and the, and the guys. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. So for us, because we're we're quite traditional SaaS in the sense that we're ed tech and we focus on corporate training, um, we are able to tap into traditional advertising models like LinkedIn, um, like uh, sort of direct inbound in marketing through emails. Um, a lot of our clients have been inbound, which is quite nice. Um, but yeah, again, traditional methods like word of mouth, etc. cetera, um, for us. Um, I think, um, again, from a, I guess, Web3 head, um, a lot of brands are really focusing on community building and storytelling. Um, again, I'm sure Dells will be so, so happy that I keep giving him a shout out. Um, so Dells downstairs, the founder of Astroverse, again, go visit the booth downstairs. Um, they really focus on how can we actually showcase the products of the brands on our platform through storefronts on their metaverse. Um, so those those natural organic ways are what I'm seeing that people are using right now rather than your traditional ads. Um, um, and I think that a lot of consumers and, and um, people that engage with the space really want that authentic um, um, interaction with, with brands. Um, so yeah, that's what I think is happening right now um, with, with the metaverse. Um, I, we obviously have brands like Decentraland as well. Um, we have brands like Vault Hill um, as well. Um, and they, they have like various means in which you can do it, where you can actually have your own virtual space. Um, so, so, yeah. Thank you both. Thanks for the question. Can we have a round of applause for both Domi and Oyen? Really, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank you, Black Deck Festival.